thank you for coming back for a, another session with me, the, the second podcast on my book, Super Energy. So this is chapter one, which is entitled The Vortex of Energy. My father was a physician and a physicist. He introduced me to radioactivity phys physics when I was a boy. I have a vivid recall of an expedition to Bodmin Moor in Cornwall when I was just seven. He bundled me and my brothers and a sister and a cousin into his old Rolls Royce and took us prospecting for uranium. He engendered in me a deep love of physics. I was 16 when I came across the advanced course in yogi philosophy by yogi Ramacharaka in an antiquarian library and it set me on a journey of discovery that would last a lifetime. I knew enough about physics by then to realize that I'd stumbled on something of immense importance when I read that yogis perceived atoms as vortices of prana. Knowing that prana is the Indian word for energy and realizing the book was put to print before 1905 when Albert Einstein published his famous equation E equals mc squared I was galvanized. It struck me immediately that if yogis could anticipate Einstein in realizing the smallest particles of matter are forms of energy, then in the vortex they may have uncovered the greatest enigma in science, how energy forms mass. As I followed the vortex thread through subsequent decades, I realized yogis had discovered the key to the universe. Reading the 1904 book in 1964, I knew atoms weren't the smallest particles in matter. It had to be subatomic particles that were vortices of energy. I was determined to see if the protons, neutrons, and orbiting electrons in the atom could be explained by a vortex theory. I visualized subatomic particles in matter as whirlpools of light, and as years of inquiry unfolded, it became clear to me that the vortex was a store of energy. That enabled me to explain how vast amounts of nuclear energy could be released from minute amounts of matter. The gyroscopic spin of energy accounted for the inertia of mass and the interactions between extending dynamic vortices of energy. They explained the forces of gravity, magnetism and electric charge. The vortex is a three-dimensional spiral. I realize that is why we live in a three-dimensional world. My head was forever spinning. The quantum vortex, as I call it now, shows how non-substantial energy can set up the properties of materiality. In physics, the stuff of material is defined in terms of mass, inertia, potential energy, and three-dimensional extension. These properties of subatomic particles, generally attributed to material substance, can be accounted for by spin in the vortex of energy. The quantum vortex explains away materialism. The vortex of energy exposes materialism as spin. I could call this book the material delusion. Materialism is based on our perception that something or someone exists and then acts, be it an atom moving or a god creating. The idea that something substantial pre-exists animation is a fundamental human belief. It is hard to grasp the idea that activity can exist without anything pre-existing it that acts. How can there be movement when there is no thing that moves? This conundrum may baffle lesser minds, but it is not a problem to quantum physicists and other people who have grasped the principle that everything is energy. Enlightened people have dropped the mechanical view of the universe and appreciate the non-substantial nature of matter. Albert Einstein led the quantum revolution that banished scientific materialism, but he was not properly understood because as William Berkson wrote, Einstein was difficult to understand, not because of his ideas or the mathematics he employed, 
but because of his worldview. Einstein denied the substantiality of matter and the field whilst maintaining their reality. Energy is no thing. As activity where nothing exists that acts, as movement without anything that moves, energy is an enigma. As Richard Feynman said, it is important to understand that in physics today, we have no idea what energy is. Some physicists have overcome the enigma of energy by accepting that it is abstract in nature. A number of quantum physicists have realized that the unsubstantial particles of energy underlying matter and light are more like thoughts than things. At the height of the quantum revolution, the English astrophysicist Sir James Jeans wrote, <clears throat> and this was in his book, The Mysterious Universe, published by Cambridge University Press in 1930. Today there is a wide measure of agreement that the stream of knowledge is heading toward a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We are beginning to suspect that we ought rather to hail it as the creator and the governor of the realm of matter. The underlying nature of reality as non-substantial and dynamic was already appreciated in the East. Petrov Capra summed this up in the Tao of Physics and the Turning Point when he wrote about Indian thinking that anticipated quantum theory. There is motion, but there are ultimately no moving objects. There is activity, but there are no actors. There are no dancers. There is only the dance. The Vedic seers saw the world in terms of flow and change and thus gave the idea of a cosmic order, an essentially dynamic connotation. Shiva, the cosmic dancer, is perhaps the most perfect personification of the dynamic universe. The general picture emerging from Hinduism is one of an organic, growing and rhythmically moving cosmos, of a universe in which everything is fluid and ever-changing all static forms being mere, that is, existing only as illusionary concepts. Yogis became aware of the dynamic underpin of matter when they perceived the smallest particles to be vortices of energy. It is thanks to them that we can appreciate how energy that has no mass or material substance can create massive, and seemingly substantial worlds like the world we live in. The quantum vortex was seen by yogis through the operation of extra normal powers. These enabled them to perceive energy spinning to set up a static state. This led them to declare that everything material is in essence a condensed form of mind and that manifest things are mere, the illusion of forms. If we go beyond mere in our, mere in our physical conception of reality and accept that the universe is a mind and particles of energy are more like thoughts than things, then because thoughts are particles of intelligence, we could, we could conclude that particles of energy are particles of intelligence. This would imply that intelligence is, is innate in the quantum, which would in turn suggest that in intelligence is universal. If the universe were intelligent, then it would seem to be obvious that universal intelligence could underlie the evolution of life. If that were so, we might have to reconsider the popular presumption that the peak of intelligence is in the human head. Quantum intelligence could predicate for intelligence at every level in the universe. It would enable intelligence to be presumed in evolution without needing to assume the existence of a creative intelligence acting from outside the universe. Instead, we could imagine we are in a universe that is evolving from the innate intelligence in its quantum fabric. This brave idea would allow for the possibility 
It is not just humans, but the entire universe that is driving forward systems of creative evolution, capable of discovery, art and innovation. Surely this is evidence. Is it not obvious that intelligence is innate in the myriad forms of life all around us? There could be intelligence in the shape of the quantum of energy and memory in the multitude of forms resultant from quantum interactions. If the vortex and vibrational forms of energy are more in the nature of thoughts than things, intent could underlie the process of evolution. And the universe might not be as pointless as many educated people presume. If the universe is a collective of quantum drops of intelligence, because intelligence implies consciousness, the universe could be underpinned by an ocean of creative consciousness with awareness, intent and purpose in its depths. Maybe molecules in the matrix of living matter are forms of intended creative imagination. If that were so, traditional ideas of spirit and creation could be reviewed in terms of creative potential and intent emerging from universal consciousness and quantum intelligence. Evolution could be seen as a process of learning through chance, trial and experiment by universal consciousness and intelligence. An appreciation of quantum intelligence could allow us to uphold consciousness as a universal principle without having to abandon science. From that standpoint, I believe quantum physics would enable us to embrace the essential elements of spirituality and science without religious overtones. Physicists believe the universe is intelligent and self-aware. And I quote there Hoyle from The Intelligent Universe, published by Michael Joseph in 1983, and Amit Goswami in The Self-Aware Universe, How Consciousness Creates the Material World, published by Thatcher in 1993. So physicists believe the universe is intelligent and self-aware and that consciousness underpins the world we live in. In ancient Greece, Plato taught that consciousness created the world. A generation before Plato, Democritus was teaching that matter was composed of indestructible material atoms. His insight into the particulate nature of matter was brilliant but his presumption that the randomly interacting atoms were substantial was wrong. Einstein challenged that presumption when he established that non-substantial particles of energy underlie atoms. Einstein established the particulate nature of energy. That is quantum reality. In his equation, E equals mc squared, he revealed that non-material particles of energy underlie matter as well as light. On one hand, Einstein upheld the particle concept of Democritus, but on the other, he repudiated the idea of particle materialism that emerged in the philosophy of Democritus. Particle materialism is unscientific. To see why, imagine rain falling to form streams tumbling down the mountainsides in the Alps. These join the torrent of rivers that pass through hydroelectric plants where the fall of the water is converted into the spin of turbines and then the flow of electricity. The electricity is then fed into CERN, where it is used to accelerate protons. As the protons collide in the intersecting rings of the Large Hadron Particle Accelerator, their arrested motion is transformed into mass. The kinetic energy derived from the motion of falling water has been converted into new particles of matter. In the fall of the rain and the tumble of streams, the torrent of rivers and the spin of turbines, the flow of electricity and the acceleration of protons, no material substance was transferred to form the new particles. Activity alone was transferred between each step of the process. As nothing went into the newly formed particles of matter but activity, obviously they can be nothing but forms of activity the activity we call energy. 
the vortex of energy reveals in an obvious way how activity can form particles of matter, how energy forms mass. People have been told that matter is a form of energy, but while physics has provided equations and the evidence for this, up until now there has been no simple visual model in physics to match the naive realism of solid material atoms attributed to Democritus by the Roman writer Lucre Lucretius in his poem De Rerum Natura. The classic model of material particles cannot explain how mass is formed of energy, whereas the vortex of energy derived from yogic philosophy shows how light can form matter and how spin can set up the illusion of a material particle. The idea of the vortex of energy originated in yogi philosophy and in that same philosophy yogis taught that light is a dense level of thought. They contended that they, there are finer levels of mind beyond the world of density we live in with a more subtle light than the light we perceive. The success of the vortex applied to quantum physics gave me overwhelming confidence in the philosophy of yoga, but to adopt yogi thinking about the higher levels of mind, I had to plunge through the light barrier with the premise that there may be worlds of super energy existing beyond the speed of light. So. Thank you very much for listening to that resume of the Vortex Theory. And the next podcast will be on the subject of super energy itself. So I look forward to your return to enjoy the next podcast in this series.